Hello and welcome to the Dharma Podcasts. This is the second and concluding part of the Dharma Podcast series explaining the methodical and systematic manner in which the colonial British destroyed Hindu charitable institutions. If you haven't already checked out the first part, please click the link given in the description below. So in the previous part of this series, we have seen how uh, the British Governor General Lord Wellesley drastically reduced the endowments given to Hindu charitable institutions from 8,55,000 to just about 2 lakh rupees in the Mysore Kingdom. This reduction had far-reaching consequences not just for these charitable institutions but for the traditional culture of food sharing and the sacred cherished cultural practice of Annadanam, something that India had always been renowned for countless centuries. The fall and the destruction was swift. As early as 1829, the new Governor General William Bentinck was gloating in a letter about the great success of this destructive British project of systematically driving India to starvation. He says in a letter that there was now a great demand for all European luxury items by upper class and wealthy Indians. I paraphrase the letter, quote, It is remarkable, even in the celebration of the most sacred Hindu festivals, a great change is perceptible in Calcutta. Most of what used to be freely distributed among beggars and Brahmins is now devoted to the ostentatious entertainment of Europeans and generally the amount spent in useless arms has been greatly curtailed. Close quote. Bentinck was indeed speaking the truth. The closer the educated Hindus came to the Europeans, the more they became like them and the more they imitated their manners, customs and lifestyles and sadly, they developed the same European contempt towards the natives and their food-sharing practices. Of course, Bentinck claims that this was for the betterment of the natives. The more Hindus gave up their sacred tradition of Annadanam and other customs, the more civilized they would become. And so by 1870, Annadanam and traditional Hindu charity was being condemned by Hindus themselves. This was most noticeable in Bengal because it was the earliest victim of British colonial conquest. These Hindus, now armed with English education, and under the heavy influence of the British regarded traditional Hindu charity and hospitality as a great social evil that needed to be consistently combated and ultimately eliminated. And so when we read in history textbooks about Hindu social reform, we must look at it with a new lens because destroying this great tradition of charity and hospitality also formed part of the so-called reform agenda. On November 15, 1870, Keshab Chandra Sen wrote in his paper named Sulab Samachar, and I quote, Giving alms to beggars is not an act of kindness because it is wrong to live on another person's charity. Close quote. A self-respecting sentiment, no doubt, but Keshav Chandra Sen's uh, article does not suggest how incapacitated beggars, how poor people who have no arms or legs or both, how such people should eat. Instead, the same article says that such people should be trained to do useful things for society without mentioning what those useful things were and how a lame person uh, could actually do these useful things. 
and so this attitude of demanding work from those who do not have enough to eat over time became some sort of uh, received wisdom even among the relatively well-off Indians and especially among those who claimed to have acquired a modern and rational consciousness. But then the Hindu tradition of Annadanam and food sharing proved a far tougher nut to crack than the British had originally assumed. When endowments to charitable institutions were deprived were greatly diminished, Hindus retained this practice at the individual and the family level. This upset and angered the British administration so much that the Famine Commission of 1880 noted the following in the report dated July 7, 1880 and this report is very important and I quote, Native society in India is justly famous for its charity. It is owing to the profound sense which is felt by all classes as a religious duty of helping and providing for the indigent and helpless people that in ordinary times no government measures of relief are needed. Native charity does not work according to the English pattern. It does not tend to organization and such charity is to be encouraged at the beginning of distress but when famine has once set in with severity, it may become a serious evil unless it can be brought under some systematic control. Close quote. And what was this systematic control? Quite obviously, a total control by the government. And this report recommended it in so many words and I quote again. Public distribution of arms to unknown applicants should be discouraged and, if possible, entirely stopped. Close quote. And so, once the state stepped in, once the British government came into the picture, the officials wanted the Hindus, with their spontaneous and traditional charitable impulses, to simply get out of the way and to completely stop their ancient practice which had for centuries transformed into a great cultural value. And what did the British replace this ancient system with? The answer, every poor person, every applicant, every supplicant was given only a survival wage and enough grain to last for just one day and nothing more. This was not bhiksha in the sense that Indians had known it. The applicant had to work really hard for it, often under brutal conditions, lifting heavy weights, rocks, boulders, and doing all sorts of uh, uh, heavy manual labor. And what about those people who weren't healthy enough to do such work? Such people were given dole, that is, a small amount of food grain and then a British bureaucrat would examine him periodically and if this person merely looked healthy in the eyes of this bureaucrat, the dole would be immediately stopped and he would be sent to work. To cut a long story short, Annadanam was a violation of the British or European sense of ethics because free food without doing work in return was a moral violation in their eyes. Thus, even in famine, the British set up extraordinary government controls to regulate the distribution of food even to starving people and a faceless official would decide who was starving and who was not. The same British famine report of 1880 that I mentioned earlier led to the creation of an elaborate bureaucracy for managing famine and relief efforts. Its mechanisms and justifications are rooted in this same fundamental British or European attitude towards food or in other words, it operates on the premise that Annadanam 
that is giving away free food is unethical and is a great social evil this report is still the basis for the management of famine and relief measures even in independent india and this is precisely how the colonial british systematically and institutionally destroyed willingly wantonly destroyed not just hindu charitable institutions but created a nation of beggars before closing this episode i will narrate a very evocative a very moving story written by dr j k bajaj in his marvelous book titled annam bahukurvita research for this podcast comes from the material given in that book so here is that story not so long ago when mother would sit down to prepare rotis we the children of the house gathered around the hearth and watched she would take the first ball of dough touch it with a little ghee and give it to one of us to run into the street find a cow and put the ball of dough in her mouth only then would mother put the griddle on the fire and next she would take a rather small bit of dough dip it in ghee wipe the griddle with it and leave it on the side to be offered to the ants or the crows later the next full ball of dough was rolled into a roti and put on to the griddle but this first roti mother would cook only on one side touch it with a little mustard oil and then it was the turn of another one of us to run and offer it to a dog the next two rotis were cooked and kept aside for the gurudwara along with a bowl of the day's vegetable curry or dal later the wife of the gurudwara priest would come and collect her share she collected such offerings from perhaps 40 houses and that would have probably sufficed for her family as well as the occasional guest who sought shelter in the gurudwara we were young then and our appetite used to be sharp but howsoever hungry we might have been we had to wait for mother to take out the share of the cow the crow the dog and the gurudwara before being served and in spite of the gnawing feeling of hunger in our stomachs it somehow felt good to wait the touch of the warm and wet tongue of the cow as she slurped the ball of dough out of her young hands felt distinctly like a blessing offering a specially cooked roti to a stray dog filled us with a satisfying feeling of warmth and when the wife of the gurudwara priest came to collect her share the food and the house seemed to have been sanctified this was not the only food that was shared out from our otherwise simple home where lunch or dinner almost invariably consisted of a single dal or a vegetable curry to go with the rotis but the beggars of whom about 4 or 5 used to call at our door every day were always given a handful of flour each this too was a job for us the children and taking out a handful from the pot of flour and pouring it into the cloth bag of the beggar thoroughly soiling the hand with the flour in the process used to be a pleasure in itself like the wife of the gurudwara priest the cleaning lady also came and collected her share of rotis and occasionally a small serving of curry or dal and it seemed as if food was flowing all day mother considered it to be an unimaginably bad omen for the vessel of flour or the box of rotis to get completely empty at night when all food was exhausted mother would make it a point to leave a small bit of roti in the box as we began to grow older this flow of food began to ebb the wife of the gurudwara priest began to feel shy about going around collecting food she preferred the gurudwara's share to be offered in money 
the roti for the lady who cleaned the streets began to seem too expensive. It was replaced with a substantial increase in our share of her monthly wages, which of course remained much below the price of a roti a day even after the increase. The handful of flour for the beggars was substituted with a 5 or 10 paisa bit and later even this inconsequential bit of money came to be grudged and the beggars more or less stopped coming. And as we began to get educated and learnt about the new ways, the roti for the cow and the dog began to look like wanton waste of good food and the insistence on keeping the pot flowing seemed like some kind of silly superstition. Times seem to have changed thus in the last 30 or 40 years. What mother used to do was of course a highly abbreviated version of what Indians of a more affluent period would have done. She was not performing Pancha Maha Yajna as Manu would have prescribed it, nor taking out substantial shares for all as the people of Chengalpattu did in the 18th century. Most Indians had probably lost the prosperity and plenty essential for undertaking the kind of observance that encompasses the whole of creation in all its generosity. Yet, mother was keeping the memory alive. And perhaps still very recently, many of the Indians, though not of the relatively resourceful ones, were trying somehow to keep at least the form of the discipline of sharing before eating that seems to be such an essential characteristic of being Indian. They were in no position to follow what they remembered to be the discipline, but they cherished the memory. The memory remained sacred. With that, we conclude the series. If you like the Dharma podcasts, please share our episodes and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. To empower us to create more such podcasts, please consider making a contribution by clicking the link given below in the description. If you have any feedback or suggestion that you would like to share, please let us know in the comment section. And until next time, thank you.